Matt DeCourcy is the Parliamentary Secretary for the Minister of Foreign Affairs for Canada. He's also the MP Liberal for Fredericton Oromocto area. Our conversation touched on many things. Specific details, not so much. More we talked about process. In general terms, we tend to think of our elected officials as making decisions on our behalf. But maybe what actually happens is they spend more time working on the process and following the wishes of their electorate. Hope you enjoy the conversation. So thanks for taking the time. I appreciate you're probably pretty busy. Dennis, thanks for having me back. This is uh, this is the third time we've been able to sit down, I think almost about two years apart on relative clockwork. So it's great to be back. And your hair color hasn't started to change yet. It's always uh, been one of those. I grew out a beard a little bit over the holidays um, while there was a bit of downtime. And I am starting to notice some gray hairs it's as gray. well as in my sideburns. But I'll probably lose it all before it goes completely gray <laughs> anyway, given my genealogy. So Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Because that's one of those things when you're in the public eye and people are taking pictures over time. Probably uh, former President Obama was the most noticeable yeah. with what his hair looked like when he started and, and the gray that kicked in by the time he was done. Hopefully you'll you'll fare better. Uh, you know, I, I, I think the the stress-inducingness that, that leads to gray in many ways is a good thing, especially for somebody who enjoys being around the community enjoys being with people yeah. um th there are challenging things that we do uh, but i always tell people the good things are really good and the challenging things are good because they get you out of bed in the morning to to work yeah. on behalf of people yeah. and i started on the soft side because it frustrates me that people forget that you're a person once you become <laughs> an mp or an mla or a still matt to city council person um, we tend to objectify our politicians to a fairly high degree. There's a lot of um, negative vibe at times around being a politician. Um, you can probably find a poll somewhere that shows where politicians rank in things that they trust. And, and that's such a misdirection because what's really going on is the conversation needs to get a lot better to understand what you go through and what the dynamic's like. So it's almost like a peek into the huddle or a peek into the locker room. Yeah. So can you share with us in the, in the past two years, roughly, um, what's the high point of your learning curve from you're on the outside, I want to become the MP? Right. And not, now I am, and you're in the thick of it now. Absolutely. Um, I, I think one of the greatest lessons that I've learned um, over the course of running for office and now having been in office for a little over two years is the importance of relationship building. Um, and, and I don't think it's unique to politics or government at all. I think if people were to step back and look at the field in which they operate, the work they do, the lives they lead, they would acknowledge hmm. um, that decisions get made and things get moved when people develop rapport and a level of trust and build relationships uh, amongst each other. So uh, for me, it's been tremendously important when I'm in Ottawa to build good relationships with colleagues, both uh, within the government side as well as opposition colleagues to help uh, move things um, that are within the government's agenda, but also different legislative and committee matters forward. And when I'm home in Fredericton, to be available to people to build on relationships uh, to help advance the priorities of the community and the communities that I get to represent. So that's been probably the height of lessons the top lesson that I've learned over the last couple of years. And um, and if I were to um, share with uh, anyone who was thinking about a life in the public eye, I would say go out and do the things that you want to do to experience the world, but take care of building good relationships with people regardless of where they are and what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Two different communities, Fredericton and Ottawa. Yes. Can you uh, map us out what it's like between the two? Sure. I, I, I guess the way I would look at it, um, not so much in the in the different communities, but the, the different um, activities that, that I undertake when I'm in Ottawa vis-a-vis -vis Fredericton. Uh, for the last year, I've had the opportunity to work as the parliamentary secretary to Christopher Freeland, our foreign minister. Mm -hmm. uh, and so my days in Ottawa over the last year have been... Um, busy um, getting briefed on matters of international significance and 
on Canada's place within those uh, dynamic challenges that the world is facing. Uh, busy meeting with incoming delegations of uh, ambassadors, uh, foreign officials, as well as not-for-profit organizations who do uh, work in the realm of diplomacy or international development around the world, uh, human rights building uh, being a, a really significant mm -hmm. uh, aspect of that. Um, I've had now a year's worth of question periods to be prepared for and be on my feet answering to the opposition about the government's position on a range of matters when uh, when the minister, when Christia is traveling and, and unable to be in the house. Um, and on top of that, I follow as a as an associate member the uh, the Foreign Affairs Committee. So the work of that committee, both in examining different uh, situations um, in 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 areas of the world that are undergoing conflict or or human development issues and moving legislation through that committee uh, in a way that uh, meets the needs of parliamentarians and uh, and moves the government's agenda forward. So um, again, a lot of relationship building involved in those activities. At the same time, when I'm in Ottawa, uh, I have to find time to advance the priorities of our region, both both the Fredericton and Oromocto and, and Greater Grand Lake uh, community, as well as you know the economic growth objectives of our province and of um, uh, of the region, and um, and so finding that balance in Ottawa um, has been, quite frankly, it's been fun to to figure that out, and uh, and then to get home on a Friday, <laughs> to be available at the market Saturday morning and meet with people either at a range of activities that take place around the community. Or um, schedule, you know, meetings with with different uh, interested uh, individuals, groups, and stakeholder organizations. So that's the general thrust of the dynamic between the two for those. What effectively turns into three out of four weeks, eight months of the year that the house sits. Uh, the other time of the year, uh, you know, mid December to the end of January, I'm largely in Fredericton, safe some travels on mm -hmm. the foreign affairs file. And that's the same thing from the, for the summer, generally in Fredericton, mm -hmm. um, save for some international travels uh, to represent the government and the minister. Great. Thanks for that. Um, people will get what they get out of media, assuming they pay attention to media. Media will put things into a certain framework. And we often don't hear what day-to-day -day life is like or what what the drill or the routine is like. So thanks for sharing it. You know, broad strokes, this is kind of what it's like when you become a, an MP. Yeah, I mean, just, just to maybe tie that off, um, I rely heavily on the people who work with me, both in a formal capacity within my <laughs> office. I mean, yeah. they are the face of Matt DeCourcy when I am not there, and I've been tremendously uh, privileged to have wonderful people working with me to help resolve individual cases for people in the community who, who have challenges receiving the services to which they're entitled by the government, mm -hmm. um, helping advance projects that are of significant importance, um, and and ensuring that um, through communications activities that I'm able to communicate with people, you know, both directly and in a mediated way. So that's important. My family uh, is always there to support me. Uh, even as simply as having food in the fridge uh, when I when I drive in from the airport on a Friday night, because often there's nothing in my fridge, yeah. um, and uh, and the volunteers who continue to be supportive of me are tremendously important uh, to my ability to serve the community. Well, that sets up uh, the next question where I wanted to go play a bit because sure. um, one day you're Matt, and the next day you're MP, and. And now you're parliamentary secretary mm -hmm. of foreign affairs. The learning curve must be phenomenal. And therefore, around you, there must be such a good team. Because when media get a hold of you, they start to treat you as if you're the expert because you're the spokesperson. Right. And, and there's no way that any human under any conditions can go from, you know, this was my life up to this point in time. And in an 18-month window, it turns. And now I have to be the spokesperson for all this. So the, the, can you... 
walk us into a bit of the team that you would have in Ottawa that gives you, because that's where we need to trust the civil service again. Sure. And, and to know that that expertise is there. And, and while media might, might want to look for a conflict storyline in a narrative between conservative, liberal, NDP, um, we need to build a trust again back into that civil service that no matter who's in power, there's a stability there and sure. a skill set there that's significant. Dennis, that's a great point to raise. And, and again, I've learned a lot about that dynamic over these last two years. Um, subject matter expertise exists within our civil service on a whole range of issues. I've had the enormous pleasure of working with uh, really capable, uh, experienced, knowledgeable, both in depth and breadth of subject uh, people working at Global Affairs Canada. These are people who have served uh, in our missions abroad. These are people who have vast experience working on development issues in conflict zones as complicated as Iraq, uh, Syria, uh, Iran, uh, the situation in Ukraine vis-a-vis -vis the, you know, the threat posed by Russia, uh, who understand the dynamic of um, the rise of the middle class in China, mm -hmm. who have experience um, dealing with challenging situations in places like Venezuela, which is an ongoing humanitarian and political crisis. I am wowed at the quality of the briefings I get from these people when I need to be brought up to speed on a, on a certain issue ahead of meeting with somebody to talk about our yes. mutual interests and or where there's daylight between the view of Canada and the view of, of, of another um, state they're incredibly capable and knowledgeable and I have a ton of respect for them. At the same time, I've learned that the civil service needs to rely on elected officials who come from communities right across the country and who, when they're doing their job best, have a beat on, uh, on both the emotions uh, and the views and the opinions of citizens in their communities. Hmm. And when we get that right, I think we're at our best as a government. Um, I think there there can be there can be positive conflict in there trying to work out issues, mm -hmm. um, and uh, it won't surprise you for me to say uh, I believe in the vision and the thrust of our government, but I think there's a good dialogue that takes place between the government and and the opposition politicians and the civil service to come to a right spot on issues, and we won't always get it exactly right, but we will do our best and. And, uh, and I'm of the view, and, and my sense is largely people in this region are of the view that there's a general movement in the right direction to build more inclusive structures for people uh, in our communities. And, and I think that comes when we respect the civil service, when we respect uh, views of all political stripes, and when we consult with civil society and individuals as well. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. Uh, it's it's important. And can I, can I add to that as well? I've had the chance to travel abroad about a half. I've had the chance to travel abroad maybe four times, and and around Canada, uh, in my role as parliamentary secretary, accompanied by you know senior officials from Global Affairs, and they are so well respected, uh, in in the global arena for for their expertise in diplomacy and, and working on complicated geopolitical issues. And I have a, an enormous respect for them. Quite the exposure you had. Too bad you couldn't wear a, a body cam or something and, and let us follow and learn without That's a good idea. country secrets. <laughs> One of the things that may need to happen over time is the demystifying of what the civil service does, the relationship between political end of it and the civil service side of it so that a country can rebuild a, a sense of trust and a sense of shared vision again that media, and I want to put a lot of it on their shoulders, they tend to have that conflict narrative. And it might be that we need to get on with a cooperative narrative. We can have differences in the directions we might want to go. Sure. But in general terms, we know we need to go there because mm -hmm. we're one of the most fortunate countries in the world. Mm -hmm. And if we keep nurturing this conflict model, we're going to implode ourselves. I, I, I will say... Um I, I have been exposed to really professional media personalities um, who do a good job at holding us to account while at the same time being fair in the way they portray um, a certain issue or a story. And uh, I, I believe in the role that the media plays in, in holding 
A, holding governments to account and B, um, giving Canadians and the general public hmm. access to issues. Uh, sometimes uh, it's not always portrayed the way, I, you know, my my view of the issue is, but yeah. uh, the media do play a valuable role. And, and when we're fair with all of those different parties, I, I do think we're at our best. Yeah, that nurturing and of the, and we do a lot we do it a lot better in Canada than some places around the world. Yeah, I mean we can just look south and watch uh, the the challenges the United States are going through. No matter which narrative you want to pick, if you move back one more step from all the detail and just watch the patterns, uh, there they've got some work to do in order to get back what was you know the United States and its culture and its vision shared at a certain scale. So I, you don't need to wander into that, but there, there's. I didn't want to put you in a box, but we're at, we're in this really interesting window where things are changing. Large systems are shifting, uh, aging population or younger people looking for stability. Most of the systems that have got us through from the 50s have kind of run their course. And they, we need to start building this new way. And this building this new way is going to take a cooperative mindset more than a competitive I want to win mindset. So it'd be nice if voters voted for a vision um, rather than voting for the the chit or well, you'll never be in power so why would i vote for you there there's a connection between the cultural shift of a shared vision and the behavior pattern on the four-year election cycle and mm -hmm. the civil service creates the stability through all that right i uh, you know the uh, uh, i think political parties are important vehicles in laying out visions and and yes there are tangible um, action items that that form a part of that vision, but but you're right. We need to at the same time rely on uh, on the expertise of the civil service, working in concert with industry, with academia, with civil society, and with individuals to help move the vision down to the level where things you know are put into to place programmatically or project wise or service delivery wise. Yeah. I took a roundabout route to get to public trust, nurturing public trust from several different angles. Um, to pick up, for instance, where media would have a role to play, and you would have been sitting in it, might have been one of the first ones that, that uh, wait a second, you guys promised, and now you're not going to do it, is the electoral reform thing, which is a, you know, a little while ago now. And so it's not about the details of it. It's more about the, the process of how does a country come to shift its fundamental process of democracy like does that kind of make sense because to get into electoral reform i don't want to get into the details mechanics and stuff i want to get into the root principle about is the country ready yet for doing something like this or that assumes the current system's broken but maybe if we had 80 or 90 percent participation rates maybe <laughs> the system isn't broken yet. right and and you sat right in that cusp of i had a tremendous experience with that uh i i I wouldn't have traded that experience as one of the first things that I got to do as a parliamentarian for anything. I had tremendous exposure to a fascinating issue hmm. uh, that is much more complex than it has been allowed to be portrayed to people. Mm -hmm. I got to develop some really good relationships with colleagues within my own party and within all the opposition parties. I got to travel the entire country mm -hmm. and meet with Canadians in all provinces and all three territories. I got to listen to um, foreign officials talk about their experiences with their electoral systems and their democratic process. Um, and, uh, and so as, as a matter of learning, um, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't trade that for anything. Uh, I'm comfortable with, with where we came to on this. Uh, some of my takeaways are that... Um, our system is not perfect, uh, but it is strong. Mm. Uh, it is built upon certain values that um, I believe are important. I, I believe that uh, local representation and proximity to people uh, in communities is an important element of our democratic process, that people know who their elected official are. And I believe in this part of the country, that's um, even more acute. Mm -hmm. um, I am of the view that any democratic reform should encourage greater participation and that speaks to in one instance greater voter turnout um, and through our committee process uh, we were exposed to evidence to suggest that 
uh, electoral systems across the Western world, regardless of what system they are, are all experiencing a trend in voter decline. Yeah. So simply by changing the system, uh, there's no evidence to suggest that that gets resolved. Yeah. It might not be the solution to the challenge. Right. And, and, and the other thing that, that we came to understand is there's a level of education about the democratic process that needs to be elevated within, um, I guess, the knowledge of, of more Canadians. Not yeah. enough Canadians understand what our system is comprised of now, let alone what another system might be comprised of. And so for those reasons, um, I'm, I'm comfortable uh, with the decision not to pursue uh, a dramatic change in our, in our f uh, electoral system at this time. Um, I think the stability that we have right now in the world and the standing that we have right now in the world is incredibly important considering some of the geopolitical shifts uh, in the way we view, um, uh, I guess, liberalized trade, the way we view the importance of security around human rights. Um, and, and, and I think Canada's voice in the world right now is important on those matters. And uh, with an issue that can become really divisive when it's politicized, uh, I, think, I think it's important for us to focus on the vision we put forward on economic growth, on inclusive growth, on ensuring that underrepresented groups mm -hmm. are able to achieve socioeconomic participation in all aspects of Canadian society, Indigenous peoples, and we've made significant investments in Indigenous communities across the country. Mm -hmm. And we ha now have two ministries focusing on both the long-term relationship between the Crown and Indigenous peoples, as well as the day-to-day -day service delivery that we know is so vitally important to Indigenous communities. Mm -hmm. Another important aspect that frames both our domestic policy and our uh, foreign policy um, is a focus on women and girls and other underrepresented groups. The evidence is clear that when women are provided equal opportunity to participate in the economy, the economy does better, policy decisions that are made are more beneficial to more people, mm -hmm. and um, the, the Prime Minister, Cabinet, and the entire government have been quite clear that we need to ensure that we get that right to allow greater capacity to see more people have success in Canada. Hmm. And I mean, those are just two historically underrepresented groups. Uh, persons with disabilities need to be provided more capacity hmm. uh, to participate. And that speaks to the way we build and support infrastructure development and public transit. Hmm. Um, our climate change uh, focus is important, again, because we know that women and girls around the world uh, face the greatest threat due to climate change. Um, and if we want to be successful uh, as a country, as a global community, we need to address that. And, uh, and certainly there are challenges in doing that, but, but, but those are the focus areas for us. Thank you. Big strokes. Um, big policy, but that's the level you're working in now. But bringing it, it's got to connect like you do back to your community. Yeah, so, I'd so love to got, talk about the priorities here. Yeah, yeah, you know, because so we could talk about Indigenous and Native communities, the challenges they face. The solution isn't going to be money. Um, it's, you got to have money as a resource, but the money's been the approach for 30, 40 years, and, and there's still this water issues or water issues and such. Mm -hmm. So somewhere in that paradigm shift that needs to occur that I was alluding to earlier, that the systems and methods that we've used for 40, 50 years don't quite get us where we want to go, so something needs to shift. And now you're playing at that level of, of high-level policy and major funding that would support all that. Mm -hmm. Two key pieces, like, you know, that counts. But at some point, it's it's got to hit the road. It's it's got to make a tangible, concrete difference. Mm -hmm. And to date, there's been a gap there somehow, some way. Well, I but would. Do you have any sense of that? I I would I would argue that there are tangible improvements, and uh, in over the last couple of years, there have been over seven hundred thousand jobs created in Canada. Over the last uh, two years, we've seen um, we've seen economic growth at a rate that hadn't been seen um, in approximately 17 years. Uh, the key is to make sure that that growth 
uh, that, that people who have not always been a part of that economic opportunity are able to participate. Um, but, but I do see those steps helping. At the same time, we know that in our communities, there are still people who are struggling. Sure. Well, one, the, one of the areas of focus for me uh, in Fredericton and New Brunswick is on um, making sure that we can, uh, as an aging population, uh, provide people with opportunities to care for themselves longer in their homes, to be healthy longer, mm -hmm. uh, and also um, find ways to help provide them the type of community supports they need uh, yeah. when they do need help uh, mm -hmm. being cared for. And that's a conversation, healthy aging, that doesn't just start yeah. when you're when you're <laughs> elder on in years. I mean, this yeah, is yeah. a conversation yeah. about, about healthy living uh, yep. with younger generations as well. So two past guests on the show, Ken McGeorge, who's a, a specialist in this area, yeah. and has much to say, and as well Karen Lake, who was the guest yeah. on last week. Yeah. And so Karen, from her perspective, sees the potential for two to 3,000 decent paying jobs mm -hmm. if we could just create the training mechanism and, and get the provincial government, in this case, I think, to have the lens to understand there's a job opportunity, job creation opportunity here. Right. Keeps people in the home a lot longer for a professional in-home care system. Yeah. And that saves hospital costs. And so I would share the view that there's economic opportunity, job opportunity in the healthy aging yes. sector. Yes. And, uh, and, so, and no better place than New Brunswick. Yeah. Fastest aging population yes, in the no. country. So how do we get there then? How do we turn it into something that it hits the road? Uh, I, I can tell you that uh, the provincial government and the federal government are talking now about strategies and opportunities to do that. Um, and my focus over the last two years has been making the case to my colleagues in Ottawa and working with the provincial government, the municipalities, and those two people who you mentioned mm -hmm. as part of community roundtables to identify opportunities that we can go and and push on for for support and resources. Because yeah. that gets to the underlying issue, which is change. We're so used to doing it a certain way, right. and we really need to shift to do it another way, so we have to let go of the old way. And Can I talk about a few other things that I see as positive locally that, that I think in the long term will help us uh, face our healthcare challenges and promote healthy aging? Uh, one of which is is the, the new infrastructure at UNB, the Center for Healthy Aging. Um, that will support research and, and practice-focused research around chronic disease prevention uh, that will focus on um, uh, helping use technology in, uh, in, in helping support people age in a more healthy way and will also you know, prepare people education-wise to move into those fields. So I think that's positive. At the York Care Center here in Fredericton, um, you have the Age Well National Innovation Hub, a center of excellence, which is taking, um, you know, uh, different, uh, again, technologies and, and new applications and trying to model those to help support healthier aging. And, and the federal government, as part of the health care accord, struck with the province in December of 2016 and, 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 and worked on over the last year, has um, has invested 125 million extra dollars over the next 10 years for a home care strategy. Affordable housing will be an important part of this as well, and those mm -hmm. agreements are coming forward that will help uh, seniors uh, stay in affordable housing because you know financial security is as much a part of being mm -hmm. healthy and being well as as physical and mental health. So um, those are those are good starts. Mm -hmm. I think if we keep talking with people like Ken, with Karen, and with others with an expertise who have really good ideas mm. to pilot, mm. New Brunswick's the best place to do it. Yes, yes, we would serve the country well that way as being the, the Petri dish. English, the French, <laughs> Indigenous, newcomer, yeah. urban, rural, close, and, well connected. You've heard me say this before. Sure, and, and you know, I'll do these commentaries called As I See It, and one of them was about we have such close proximity to each other. We're the third most populated density wise right. in the country so yeah. we have access to each other we know each other we geographically close like we should be flying yeah. um, it sounds a bit like uh, the system or the process almost sounds like a bit like a caterpillar because it's exciting what you map out and but it's like it's gonna bunch up here and then stretch out there and then bunch up here and then stretch out there for the mobility if you know what i mean so it might be 
it would help the public to understand that we're at this phase in the process. So look for the outcomes to hit the street, you know, here. Don't expect them to happen in a... Tough in a four-year cycle, isn't it, Dennis? E that's yeah. the next follow-up, yeah. right? Because what, what do we make sacred mm -hmm. in the sense that we get to play with it, but we know overall, that was the an original question, yeah. we're going that way. It doesn't right. matter if you're blue or red or purple or green or orange, or it doesn't matter. No, but these things are going to be done this way. We can tinker around the edges, but... So the, you know, public health care is one of the things Canadians' identity has been on for a long time. Yeah. It's one of those moments where we, we found consensus and it took root and a shift occurred. But that was a while ago now and some of it needs to be retweaked again. So can we find those moments where consensus arrives and then it hits the action into the community? Because we have to. <laughs> That's the 20-year window we live in. So. Uh, Consensus is 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 a neat thing um, on its own. Trying to achieve consensus on an issue and 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 sure, consensus is not necessarily unanimity. Mm. But I mean, when you get a broad sense that people can find some level of comfort with a direction, yes, uh, then then you can start to move that way. Um, and and that's been another thing that I've learned is is when we make policy decisions, sometimes bold policy decisions that may be uncomfortable for people we should do our best to find some way to give those people some level of comfort with the direction in which we're moving people understand the healthcare system in the way that it was set up years ago and yep. that model is changing uh, i think we want to move to a more prevention based system that takes yep. all levels of government and all different <laughs> stakeholders and uh, innovative and entrepreneurial thinking to achieve and it takes time for people to adapt their thinking and their comfort level to a different approach, especially when they've always been yeah. sure that they could show up at the hospital and receive that service after they were already ill or sick. We want to try and keep people healthy. Yep. Uh, we know that A, it provides better quality of life, and B, it makes economic sense. Yep. Yep. Uh, so, so I think we're on that path, Dennis. Yep. Uh, my goal will be to keep seeing tangible investments made in our community which as we talked about is well set up to lead in these approaches i mean we've got we've got ourselves a talented civil service we've got the research uh, and educational capacity through our yeah. universities and community colleges um, we've got a burgeoning entrepreneurial scene we were named Canada's Startup Capital Community back in 2016. Yeah. UMB was named the entrepreneurial community in the country uh, by Startup Canada a few years prior to that. We're one of the best places to invest in. Uh, we know that we love our quality of life. We're like, you know, yeah. we're like a city in the middle of a park here in this part of the country. Yeah. Uh, we just, we need to keep moving people along in a comfortable way with, uh, with these innovative and new approaches. Thanks for that. Um, because we can dive into some of the the detail, but also talk about the process. Sure. It, it would be fascinating to see one day, it <clears throat> um, doesn't matter your political stripe, because it's such a good idea, everyone votes for it. Yeah. Everyone, almost everyone votes for it. Can I, can I give you one uh, <laughs> more localized issue that I see broad consensus on uh, across partisan stripe, uh, across the community, business, uh, all the institutions, the different mun municipalities, and that's a focus on um, increasing the capacity at our airport. Hmm. Uh, the airport is a project that, again, is a priority for, for me to see come to fruition um, you know, sooner rather than later. We've worked on reducing some of the policy barriers at the federal level, and we've worked collaboratively with our provincial colleagues to identify it as a priority because all these different voices in the community said, we understand how important this is. It, it, it helps ensure that base gauge town, which is one of the hugest yes. economic contributors, the third largest yep. uh, in the province, um, is able to see the flow of the military women and men and families who come here to serve our community. Yep. It connects the universities and UNB alone uh, generates uh, 1.2 billion in economic spinoff economic you know product to our yep. province uh, and and that's important you've got the civil uh, service you've got people working in business in in high tech and 
and the reality is now global fields, they need to be connected to the world and the world needs to be connected to us. Um, and, uh, and, and we're the, we're the seat of government. Uh, you know, governments need to be connected to us as well. So, um, that is a, a localized regional project that I've seen consensus develop over. And, and because of that, uh, it's been a focus of mine to, to help move that and, and I'll keep moving on it until it's accomplished. Do you remember when there was a chance for New Brunswick to have an international airport, but the three mayors argued with each other so much in the mid eighties <laughs> that the federal government decided, no, we, we can't help you out. Do you, so are we past that? That's my point. Do you so, think? so admittedly, I wasn't paying attention to the public <laughs> policy conversation, uh, then as, as much as I am now, I think at this point, there's a recognition that Fredericton is the capital city in New Brunswick with everything that's going on needs that capacity here. And that has been, uh, a value shared uh, and a view shared by all of my predecessors hmm. as, who were members of Parliament, Keith, Andy, Bud, yeah. uh, Bob. I mean, they all they yeah. all supported that uh, project and that institution. Um, one thing that we focused on as an Atlantic region um, through the Atlantic growth strategy is working more together in the areas of infrastructure innovation, green technology and climate change, immigration. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that to support economic growth, there's no better way to do it than through people. Mm -hmm. Bringing people here with their unique skills and abilities and bringing their families with them, yep. uh, people who help them uh, in the settlement process and, and to be well and, and, and secure in themselves. Uh, so those have been focus areas that right from the Prime Minister's office through the Minister of innovation, economic uh, development and science, the immigration minister, the the four now five um, federal ministers from Atlantic Canada and the four premier's offices have been working incredibly hard on uh, to ensure that where there are opportunities to collaborate um, on, on initiatives and on projects that uh, can be more efficient, can be more affordable, but can also provide a quality of level of service that, uh, that we do that. So um, understanding that even within Atlantic Canada, there are unique uh, differences within communities and, and areas. Um, we, we know that as a region, we need to work together to ensure that we have a strong voice uh, on the Canadian level. Two other fields to play in a little bit, um, and they're related: climate change and food security. Yeah, one of the conversations related. Yeah, yeah, one of the conversations that comes up constantly around this table is: that New Brunswick grows, you know, seven or eight percent of its own food. We import you know, over ninety percent of our own food. Small population with the land mass we have. Um, there used to be thirteen or fourteen hundred family farms. There's now mm -hmm. three or four hundred family farms. Mm -hmm. There's a whole move back to how do we support ourselves, sustain ourselves, given climate change and what's happening in California and impact on food systems and in southern U.S. and impact on food systems. It would make sense that you know Atlantic Canada and that upper right-hand corner of North America, where we have water and we have land and we yeah. have trees, you know. Yeah. that we should now start planning for 20 years from now on our food security strategies. Uh, does any of that come up in, in your world? It certainly does. Um, we know that traditionally we have relied on our fishery in this region, uh, not only to feed ourselves, but tremendous capacity there to yeah. help feed the rest of the world. Yes. And, and we know that the, um, that the demand for, for protein and, and sea protein what is, is only going to go up uh, in years to come. So investments are being made there. Um, we also know that the, the agri-food sector itself is evolving and innovating and, and there are ways that we need to build capacity um, you know, back on the land there as well. And I know our agriculture minister is focused there and agri-food uh, features prominently in Canada's innovation strategy, ensuring that that we're, um, we're feeding ourselves and, and, and we're in a position to help feed the world too. Um, so at the federal level, those are two ways in which uh, we are working on matters of food security and, and, uh, and long-term stability. I also think through immigration uh, initiatives, we're seeing people coming to our region 
and uh, and moving into those fields as well and i think it's important that we foster that and i also know there are there are organizations like the ville here in marysville Mm -hmm. who are working on agricultural education programs with different populations some from underrepresented groups and we should be supporting those initiatives too there's there's again there's an economic growth opportunity there but the, it's also important for our long-term security yeah. stability given given the the changing climate of the yeah. world it's one of those topics that a lot of things have to happen at the same time in a lot of different places yeah yeah but you sit at that intersection and so in a way that the leadership and and um, support mechanism for that coordination um, that's one of the many shifts that are occurring that we can see those paradigm shifts. There's going to be shifts in our food security. There's going to be shifts in our transportation systems. Yeah. Yeah. And politics becomes the place where all those decisions um, intersect. Right. right. And it would be nice if, if, in general, people understood that there's more consensus that goes on than there might be portrayed at times <laughs> in media. I, I mean, I, I, I think in, in Canada there is, you know, take take some of the... The political opposition that that comes to play on things out of the picture and there is a general consensus on the need to have a long-term view on our um, as you say our transportation systems our infrastructure i mean a 10-year plan to invest in infrastructure yep. is significant in the canadian context but absolutely we need to be yeah. thinking 20 30 years out as well yeah so there's an interesting dynamic um i'm wondering if the country would hear heave a sigh of relief if they ever saw out of the house of commons one day when opposition leader no matter which color would go that's a great idea (laughs) rather than the role of opposition is to oppose and find you know because there's a merit to challenging pieces and parts but there's also something that we collectively would go oh finally they agree on something so i have heard i have heard i mean i haven't heard that's a great idea but i have heard uh, we support the government in this measure uh, we uh, believe in in a in a in a Team Canada approach, hmm. uh, specifically as it relates to the ongoing dynamic uh, between ourselves and our and our friends to the south. So, um, so that does exist. Uh, there are great ideas um, uh, entered or, or brought to the fore by hmm. members of all political stripes. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes those conversations are had. Uh, behind uh, not uh, just away from the camera mm-hmm. so that a real honest conversation can be had and, and I can tell you that um, my colleagues in cabinet have worked across party lines to help bring some good ideas into the government's focus um, uh, you know in areas of, of, of support and, and, and working with indigenous communities is, is <coughs> area um, working on a uh, housing strategy for the country, which again yeah. is a long-term play. Yeah. Those there's a, there are ideas that come from all over the place, and yeah. and we do need to to respect and and value those ideas for what they offer. I was poking at one of those shifts that need to occur, because if the challenge we have is a 20-year solution or a 30-year solution, like education or healthcare, then somewhere along the way we have to get out of that four-year cycle of oh that's what they wanted to do but now we're in power so this this shift between governance and being in power you know the there are two very different approaches to shared challenges Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there there are things that need to be done uh, in the immediate term and 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 you know given that we have a four-year mandate we know we have to move promptly on things to set the wheels in motion Mm -hmm. um and uh and certainly i'd like to have the opportunity to see this through uh, for a longer period than four years, I absolutely love what I get to do, yeah. uh, and uh, and and that would be the answer I would give anyone and everyone. It's a complete joy to be a part of this. Um, there's an exciting pressure to things, and there's also a really great sense of reward um, when uh, when I get to connect with people in the community. Um, and uh, and sometimes there's there are conversations that are challenging, um, but I think people are really reasonable in the way they approach me when when they when they do so, and so I certainly appreciate it. And we'll check in with you really at, like uh, in the fourth year when it gets a little hotter. See how much grayer I've gotten, Dennis. <laughs> yeah. What's been the most challenging so far? Um, I at first 
uh, on a personal note, I mean, I had, uh, I recognized, I think, six to eight months in that I probably needed to uh, be healthier in some of my habits. Um, I found myself probably not sleeping as much as I should, or, or not sleeping as, maybe not sleeping as much, but just the hours that I was sleeping weren't yeah. as conducive to a healthy lifestyle. Uh, making sure that I kept a, a, a healthy diet as much as possible, you know, everything in moderation, right? Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and and making sure that, uh, you know, I, I exercised well as well. So I've, I've learned to take the time to exercise and get to the gym. And it provides me an opportunity to see people and talk with people when yeah. I'm there as well. So yeah. that's enjoyable. Yeah, you might always be on in a way. Look, uh, that is part of 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 the lifestyle that I lead with this with this job, and uh, I'm really happy to do so. And uh, I love the opportunity yeah. to talk with people. When we spoke a year ago, I asked you a question about the natural tension it comes with representing a geographic area, mm-hmm. and then a party that would say, "We need you to vote this way," because that that goes with the turf. It's just yeah. part of the job. Have you run into that yet? Where You've had to vote along party lines, even though your your constituents were saying um, we would prefer you voted the other way. Uh, no, um, there are so, so. No, I haven't found myself in that stuck in that spot stuck in between that, stuck stuck in that spot yet. Mostly because the things that we are moving forward with are things that we committed to doing things that that I was comfortable with when I decided to put my name forward and run with with the party under the leadership of the of the party and of the prime minister there are private members bills that get brought forward in the house of commons that um, often um, I can see merit to or value in and uh, the great thing about being in Ottawa is the chance to talk with people who can raise challenges with certain aspects of of those bills and or provide insight into how that is being incorporated into something else that the government is trying to achieve or that the government is doing so i've i felt comfortable with the conversations i've had with my cabinet colleagues and and ministers who are the lead on on certain files um i mean per, to be perfectly honest the the vote is yes or no it's not like i believe 52 percent this way and 48 percent that way um it, it would be only human to be a bit conflicted on some things yes. but but i've i've resolved to feel comfortable with 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 my voting record so far and the way that issues are worked through yeah. um in ottawa thanks for that because that's some of the human face that goes with the job and rather than the objectified you were supposed to do this you right, know, right it it yeah, it personalizes it. So thanks for, for no sharing problem. that. Um, <clears throat> we're almost done. How would you like to end? Uh, I mean, I, I take every opportunity to thank people for the opportunity that I've that I've been afforded. Um, I know that uh, I don't always have um, answers that satisfy everyone and... Um, and I respect the views that people have on certain issues uh, where we may disagree. I have a tremendous amount of respect for the reasons they come, people come to those views and, and, and the decisions they take on things. Um, I've, I've also, uh, and, and this is how you started off, Dennis, by explaining we come to this job with without a complete knowledge of all the issues. And I've come to learn to rely on colleagues uh, as well as people with subject matter expertise or experience in an issue to help inform me about the the relative merits or um, drawbacks of certain issues. I mean, we have to rely on each other in this job. And uh, on top of that, I mean, any person only has so much bandwidth <laughs> with which to to hold, you know, knowledge of something or remember something or comprehend something. So. Um, yeah. We've said this a few times throughout this conversation. It's 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 a, it's a real human experience hmm. being you know an elected official. Yeah. Uh, but again, I love it. <laughs> Absolutely love it. 
What's in the near future for you? What's what's your schedule like the next couple of months? Um, so we uh, we will sit in Ottawa from the very end of January uh, to the end of June, and and again the general schedule of things tends to be three out of every four weeks is a sitting week, and then there's a week generally around uh, the statutory holidays that exist: Family Day, March breaks, Easter, the May long weekend, Victoria Day, um, where we get to be back in our communities. Um, my schedule uh, as a rule is to fly up Sunday evening or, or Monday morning and fly back Friday evening because I'm generally on duty for question period on Fridays because because yep. my minister is uh, busy. Is busy. Um, there will also uh, likely be some travel uh, involved uh, on the file as parliamentary secretary uh, for some of that time. We've got, we've got a busy agenda internationally this year we chair the g7 the group of seven um and uh and uh, and we have an ambitious agenda domestically and in the world and uh, and you know people want canadian um they want canadians and they want canada as a part of the conversation um, in their countries and so we need to be available to provide whatever support uh, we can and also learn from them as well yeah. so uh, uh hoping to have some of those experiences uh, again uh, in this uh, sitting of parliament thank you thank you that was wonderful thank you for watching be good have fun love each other the dennis report is an independent media production to support the program go to dennisatchison.com and click become my patron on patreon